my honor to introduce uh, our first guest, Jeffrey Deku, Chairman of the Autonomy Institute and uh, the Path for Commerce uh, for Autonomy. The Autonomy Institute is working to provide reference architectures and blueprints for the development of autonomous infrastructure labs, autonomous mobility corridors, and full autonomous city deployments. This will stimulate mutual testing and development regions and advanced autonomous system deployment. So thanks for joining me today, Jeff. I appreciate you taking the time to have us. Excellent. It is uh, great to see you, and we've been spending a lot of time together. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about the discussion we're going to have. And just so everybody knows, I have my fake house behind me. Jeff's got a real one behind him. I covet thou, thou, uh, thou <laughs> your office, well, especially hey, the saber tooth in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very All much. Right. Awesome. So, and you're in Austin, Texas, is that correct? Um, in, in Austin, Texas, and um, have been in Texas for almost 40 years. So beautiful, beautiful. All right. Well, um, we got a lot to cover on this topic in a really short period of time. Um, first, share a little bit about your background. How did you get get here? Um, the entire background that um, I've experienced has all been around enterprise software. So primarily um, building and um, focusing on enabling technology in the enterprise space dating back to the, the 90s. Um, that's primarily focused on things like the internet, um, cloud, um, mobile. And then about 10 years ago, saw the opportunity of what uh, autonomy was going to do mm -hmm. and the, the massive productivity gains we were going to get from it. And that led me to um, you know, start pursuing autonomous systems. And after a long journey um, with you know, many, many partners and a lot of incredible people, um, we stood up the Autonomy Institute to really address that last, the, the critical divide that uh, is keeping autonomy from scaling. Mm -hmm. And that really goes to the heart of what iMasons has been doing for, for a long time, is how do we enable the underpinning infrastructure to allow all these advanced industry 4.0 applications? Mm -hmm. and, and you and I, you and I had a number of conversations about this. That uh, you know, you're, you've been in the software side for so long, you yeah. you never saw yourself <laughs> being here, right? No. no. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it 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 became interesting. We we uh, there's a long journey um, to to get to here, but I'd say that um, we reached the conclusion in 2017 that um, the software was ready, autonomous systems were were ready. Um, but the enabling physical infrastructure was missing. And mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time with some very, very big companies and a lot of federal agencies um, to only quickly realize that everybody saw the same problem, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't being addressed effectively to, to address what is this enabling infrastructure and where is it? And uh, what we determined, it, it's, it's on the sidewalk mm -hmm. and there's going to be a lot of it. And it basically not uh, only enables connected and autonomous cities, but it also accelerates the adoption of 5G. Um, it, it truly eliminates the digital divide um, and really empowers cities to be far more effective on meeting the needs of their citizens. You know, this, there, everything you said, there's like three or four things we're gonna dive into. They're all, all really important. Um, you know, I, I keep hearing this thing about, uh, they said cloud is going to kill the data center, right? Then edge is going to eat the cloud. And I think what, what it really comes down to is it all materializes into something physical. Yeah. And so it's interesting that that connection, we can do software and get things moving very quickly, but if you don't have the underpinnings, the actual foundational infrastructure, it doesn't work. And so there's always been this, this kind of battle between the two. And it's interesting to watch that, that your journey, as you just said, you went from, from software that's enabled to be able to do that to, wait, I don't have the, the foundation to actually make it run. Exactly. So, well, so, yeah, they, we've, we've been hearing for, for 20 years now, software is eating the world. And mm -hmm. I, I very much embrace that, but that software runs somewhere. And um, you know, for the, the internet to scale the way it did, it had to run in the cloud. Um, for mobile devices to scale the way they have, we needed things like iPhones and Android devices. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to this next digital layer, um, where that's going to live is um, on the sidewalk, um, as well as other key technologies. We believe the, the work that some of the very large you know, tower you know, companies have done over the last you know, 20 years is going to be critically um, mm -hmm. important to this build out. And we believe that macro 
or micro data centers within cities are going to be super critical. Um, but what we realized in 2017 is the actual sensors that had to be fused together and to give that really critical insight of the situational right. awareness had to be processed at the curb. So let's, there's been a lot of talk about edge and everyone seems to have a different de definition of it. Um, and I'd like to hear what the Autonom Autonomy Institute's vision is around this, because this didn't happen overnight. As you were saying, this is 2017 yeah. and a lot of people, and you actually maneuvered in many different ways to get to this point. So what is the Autonomy Institute and why was it created? Um, the heart of the Autonomy Institute, we say, is a path to commerce for connected and autonomous things. Um, mm -hmm. We believe the, the impact we're going to see for small you know, devices like rovers delivering you know, home goods and you know, restaurant items to people's homes or mm -hmm. a shuttle that is able to pick up grandma at her house to bring her to the doctor or the connected and autonomous cars we keep on hearing about um, or drones performing routine tasks within cities. Um, is where we're focused our energy of what does it take to get those things to, to be adopted and to be supported. And what that led us to is, is um, working with a lot of incredible, you know, companies that have, um, I think very much, you know, there's a lot of key pieces in this infrastructure. The way we, we equate it is the FAA, um, you know, with uh, 55,000 employees, there's a reason for that. You know, they, they control things like radars, beacons, LIDARs, tremendous amount of antennas, ground-based GPS systems, as well as space-based, you know, satellites. Mm -hmm. All that works in concert to give us a resilient commercial aviation industry. And what's happening is in order for any of these systems to experience a path to commerce, we have to get the supporting technologies adopted to make it safe, secure, reliable, and, and really something that can be embraced um, by cities or even rural communities. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what you mentioned. There are a couple of pieces that are, are important. Um, the FAA has standards in which they implement of how they deploy and how they operate. And so um, you guys have been talking about uh, a standard packaging type thing here called a pin, right? Yes. And so yeah. for, for everybody on the call, this is a public infrastructure network node. And when I first saw this one, everything started clicking into place for me because first off, this looks like something that is not gonna be technology blight yep. that is happening with technology or across our, our cities right now. It's something that will be woven into the infrastructure. So can you walk us through uh, the infrastructure on that one? And I'm gonna bring up a slide to help share with that as well. Wonderful. Well, that, that developed over time. Primarily, it started um, when we approached cities back in 2018, mm -hmm. talking about we have a group of sensors that could be deployed in the city to allow them to start embracing um, you know, connected systems or just more um, uh, intelligent city applications. Um, what, we, what we found from every city, and we talked to 19 back at that time, is um, a unwillingness to actually see more technology brought into the city with justified reasons. Um, they had just come off the backside of in 2017, where the FCC chairman doing what we want to see is, is basically accelerating 5G across our cities, um, uh, basically allowed the carriers to basically strap, bolt, or attach any type of antenna or device onto the current infrastructure. So. What we walked into is um, what we believed was an exciting story to allow cities to become far more efficient and uh, impact and uh, benefit their citizens mm -hmm. into something that was actually a challenge on both sides is I think all of us want to see the end of the digital divide and all these intelligent cities to, to make us you know, more efficient and to see things like 5G, but without a new solution, um, we realized it was a huge obstacle. So the first thing we did is we, we looked around the market. We saw a lot of things that are called smart poles, and we believe that was the answer. Um, but after several months of, of working with them, we realized that they were very prescriptive in mm -hmm. their technology. They're proprietary. And um, in a lot of cases, they're, they were really focused on the LED light the expensive LED light 
and attaching the different things onto it to make it look um, you know, more beneficial to the city. Mm. That's what led us to the realization that um, a different approach had to be taken. And um, the way that uh, one technologist referred to the PIN, the Public Infrastructure Network Node, is if you were to take a 19 inch rack out of a data center and drop it on the sidewalk, what would it look like? <laughs> and that's um, kind of the incarnation of the PIN. And to be clear, the Autonomy Institute doesn't manufacture the pins. We, you know, we've, we now have four manufacturing partners that design and build and you know, ship you know, the, the devices out. Mm -hmm. And I think what's empowering about this new edge infrastructure layer is the number of jobs it's gonna create and um, really the, the new applications that's gonna really open up um, mm -hmm. when they, when you have people, you know, you have a lot of CEOs talk about the edge will be the largest infrastructure build out in our nation's history. Mm -hmm. I had a hard time understanding what, how that really could fit until the, 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 the pin was developed because that is a physical infrastructure is not as dense as transformers in everybody's yard to deliver power. Um, but probably uh, much more dense than cell towers that we see across the United States right now. Yeah. And, and, and if you see this picture, uh, just for everybody to get an idea, the base of this is the compute. So you can see that this can draw up to 20 kilowatts within each one of these units. Yeah. And then the mast is where all these sensors are. And so, so tell me a little bit about the, um, about the mast element. Yeah. So the, the mast element, um, the way we usually start telling the story from from our approach, which is uh, what do you have to do to get resilient, uh, uh, connected autonomous systems in the in the city. Mm -hmm. So if you're if we all have seen the articles where we um, autonomous cars talk about the number of sensors they have on them to make sure that they're very self aware of their environment. They have to be mm -hmm. aware of all traffic signs. They have to be aware of where the curbs are, where people are, where other cars are. Well, the the first thing that has to be done. To, to provide a far more resilient platform is that same set of sensors has to be on the sidewalk um, within in cities. Sometimes you, on, in most cities, you'll have one at every intersection, um, but in other cases, it might be even more dense than that in, in cities like uh, New York. And this the, the pin is standardizing how those components can be manufactured. So once again, we are not being prescriptive on who is the camera, who is the, the radar, who's the LIDAR, um, because a lot of pins are gonna have, you know, there, there could be five different carriers in every single pin. And there could be two different, you know, camera vendors serving different purposes in a pin. Um, so the, the other, I think the, the most important piece that came out of the development of the pin is is not actually that the technical solutions to allowing the form factor to be addressed it's that this is now being classified as a new asset class within a city right when right. you can classify something as a new asset class you now have the ability to tap into billions of dollars of private infrastructure investor funds to underwrite the deployment of these i mean because at the end of the day there are a electronic condo on the sidewalk. Um, I, everything we're talking about here, first off, the technology is fascinating. And I really think the standardization is the way this is gonna work, but it sounds expensive. And so <laughs> you just, you just uh, talked about um, these uh, uh, federal dollars and other things that, that could actually be applied to it. And that this is a new asset class. And really, if you think about the data center industry, this is when everything started to explode when data centers were now considered an asset class, a critical infrastructure component, this is also like that, correct? It 100% is. Um, because okay. there's, when you think about a pin, you and I care about, of course, the software and the, the sensors that allow all these sophisticated applications. But what it quickly developed in working with many of the energy companies is this is where they can put the footprint down for the microgrid technology that has to be further densified. Um, or, you know, we all know 5G, that's the easy story to talk about for, for mm -hmm. densification, but then ITS, intelligent transportation systems. Um, people are quite amazed when we tell them drive around a city and every time you stop at a light, 
look around the four corners, yeah. and what you're going to find is there's already a silver box that's been sitting there for, for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and in essence, um, what this will do over time is a lot of that infrastructure that exists independently will all be compressed together in a far more elegant and aesthetically pleasing environment for, for cities. Yeah. And, and let me, let me double click into that a little bit, because if you think about uh, the edge, it's not coming from the carriers, right? Cloud didn't yeah. come from the carriers. Agreed. Right. And so the motivator, I guess the thing that's going to be accelerating this is following the money. Where is the investment? What dollars are going to go in to make this happen? So you have a thing called the public private partnerships. Yes. Right. Tell me more about how that is going to enable all this to happen. Well, going to the, this, the, the core, which is there's a lot of people that want to put technology on the sidewalk. So it's, it, yeah, we hear pretty much in the news, it's always about um, the carriers and the 5G, but the also there's a tremendous appetite for getting compute um, on the sidewalk. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, some of the large cloud vendors wanted to put, you know, compute on the sidewalks to accelerate gaming. Um, and then you have ITS, which is once again, they're looking at upgrading the entire infrastructure. Um, a lot of those still operate off of switched technology or, mm -hmm. you know, analog. Mm -hmm. So those are all going to be converted over to, um, digital. So realizing that there's a lot of interest in the sidewalk, it also became clear that, um, any one vendor was not going to be able to pay and subsidize this, this build out. Right. And that was when we started spending time back in uh, late 2018 around public private partnerships and realized just like the early days of the electrification. So 1936, um, you know, the electrification act um, was stimulated by a lot of private dollars as well coming in to mm -hmm. lay the groundwork to get electric within all the, the cities across the U S and we're seeing the same thing happen with this digital edge infrastructure. And so, you know, there are already projects in place to go back and roll out infrastructure, like these other critical elements, power, water, right, fiber, et cetera. And, and you're piggybacking on parts of these, is that correct? Um, yeah, there's gonna be, I, I think a, a lot of it is, is a, a taking a new approach. So I, I think we've all heard about microgrids for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Microgrids are expensive to roll out. I mean, they've, they've done a lot with smart metering and, and others. Um, but now that we're getting so much solar on people's homes and we're getting things like battery storage on people's homes, the switching mechanisms have to be more densely you know, populated within the communities as, as well. Yeah. So I think they've been wrestling with that. Um, but there's legislative changes that will have to take place. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also like, where does that technology go? Does it go up on... The, the the poles next to the transformers or is there a new way of, of densifying that across the cities we are primarily focused on um, where ITS where RAN networks wireless you know um, networks are going in and where compute um, can be heavily utilized um, at the very start got it okay so it is expensive, but it's going to be distributed investments from lots of people that have other things that are going to compound on this. In other words, I'm doing an infrastructure investment on this other piece. This is complementary to it, and it'll now expand and accelerate uh, the edge uh, deployments across cities. A hundred percent. And the it's it's a, it's a good question. Where when we looked at it, we were thinking we spent a lot of time to to your point with the carriers, thinking that they were solving this, this. Mm -hmm. but we then did enough research to realize the CFO of any of these big carriers on their balance sheet, their CapEx, they, they can't show a plan to get that densification across the U S it's, it's, and it's not their fault. It's just super it's expensive. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Where, you know, in China, they have 700,000 5g notes already, mm -hmm. um, but they're under a completely different structure on how they, they pull it off here. We want to be an open market. We want to be collaborative. We want to be supportive of many carriers, but any one CFO can't justify the expense of um, this edge infrastructure, but you combine a couple of these together and now you're more than justifying the cost to have this infrastructure out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so it, again, I think that it's, this is the thing that will change it because now there's going to be a lot of people investing in multiple things, not just this thing that is a future potential, 
it's immediate stuff right now. Yeah. Let me let me let me change uh, change to one other thing you mentioned about digital divide. We focus on that quite a bit at iMasons, and in in our discussions before, you said that that is what is selling cities on this rollout as well. Can you elaborate on that? Well, it, it surprisingly it came out when we were looking at the locations where pins could be installed in the city of Austin, um, mm -hmm. and we kind of showed a, a dense map of anywhere between fifteen hundred to to forty five hundred pins. Mm -hmm. That's still just to, to be clear, that's still less than the ITS side. So it's 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 not, a lot of people hear those numbers and I think they're really large, but they really are not. Mm -hmm. um, when we laid that out and then we, we compared it to where the permits were coming in for 5G or for wireless build out, it, it was unbelievably clear where the investment in the t energy and time for the carriers was going. It was going where you know, the money and where the connectivity and where the density was. And, and once again, it's, it's not, it's, it, I, I don't need to, to um, cast aspersion on that because they are, they have to drive things economically and the build out is expensive. If you look at the, the pins, the pins can be deployed for a multitude of reasons. So if you can underwrite 1500 pins in the city, mm -hmm. now you can get into all communities and the first technology that will be enabled in those is going to be just getting broadband into the, the homes of all the students that are you know, doing work from home, all the teleworkers. And right. um, it, it, so it, it basically becomes the underpinning infrastructure that, that starts to equate data like electricity, where mm -hmm. you know, we don't install a transformer in someone's house and say, okay, we're only going to give you 500 watts. Um, whatever you can consume and pay for is, is what you get. And I think we're, we're going to see that happen. You know, this, this uh, reminds me of a, uh, another discussion I was having. Um, there was a, a group of eight utility companies on the East Coast, and they were um, trying to figure out why they're uh, losing money. <laughs> And it was funny because it ties right back to this. They they went back and did the de they they did an analysis of the demographics, and so they said their average ratepayer was over sixty, and then they had people that were in their twenties leaving and never returning to their area, and what they found was it was because they didn't have broadband, they didn't have interconnectivity. So now the utilities started banding together to say we're going to do fiber to the home. All of a sudden, you have people moving back. You have a whole new wave of people coming into an area that seemed to be shrinking. So technology enables these things to open up. And when you've got a digital divide, it's not because that area isn't going to be participating. It's because they can't participate. And if you open that back up, it gives opportunities to everyone, the people on that side, as well as the people that are serving it. So when you follow the money, it's a little counterintuitive. Look at, well, there's a lower income area. Yeah, but if you boost that income area up with this connectivity, everything changes. It really does. You empower the next generation of the workforce. Um, right. Yeah, there's a lot of stories about the, the you know, uh, so much research, so much of the the developments and innovations come from small towns and from mm -hmm. you know individuals that weren't you know you know blessed from the very beginning. And um, if we as a nation want to accelerate our innovation and really start to play at a much bigger clip, yeah, um, I think ending the digital divide is one of the easiest things we can do. Yeah, a challenging thing, but also this is that counterintuitive part that I think I really want people to take away. If you invest in areas, you're going to get a return. And so don't just keep a narrow focus into this is where the dollars are right now. Where are the dollars everywhere? Because once you enable all of them, everybody will participate. So um, let, me, let me shift topics here a little bit as well. Uh, there's a lot of skeptics out there on this. Oh, yeah. Right, that they don't believe there's real use cases that require ultra low latency, et cetera, for, for this edge deployment. Um, you're actually starting to roll these things out. Um, so what are the killer apps for this? What's going to start it? Um, well, on, on the latency um, you know, part, we're, once again, heavily focused on some of these advanced services. So uh, I know there's use cases like AR, VR, and gaming, and, and other things that would be, or even advertising. Um, there's, there's ways that this low latency can do for advertising. Mm -hmm. We are focused on how can we leverage this low latency to demonstrate um, at, to the federal level, a resilient, safe, secure environment to yeah. allow connected corridors to, to occur. So um, once again, we're, we're focused on those type of applications where 
Um, it might start off with small communities being activated with um, you know, autonomous shuttles or um, with rovers um, having routine restaurant delivery and um, applications like that, or like Camp Mabry. Um, the, the goal there is to activate many, many utility types of autonomy where it could be a lawn, lawnmower where you have six different lawnmowers um, that are fully autonomous that are just manicuring the lawns 24 hours a day because um, you can, and because they're all, you know, electric and um, basically allow highly efficient uh, uh, use of the, that type of service. You know, the, the, uh, the thing we were talking about too, is that there's all this little latency stuff, but it's almost like a precursor to that is what, what could this be used for today? Like digital twin data exchange, public safety. Like there's some basic stuff that people need to have this capability uh, locally. Right. And then it just boosts up the opportunity for all these lower latency ones that continue to follow. Well, you're very, uh, you met, you mentioned three of the most powerful ones. Um, so the digital twin is, is popped up to the top of the list um, primarily because the digital twin is now being seen as the vehicle to plan for the pins as far as allow far more sophisticated planning for the RAN, um, like the propagation of signals, the propagation of LIDAR, the propagation mm -hmm. of, of the radar signals. Um, and then you talked uh, also the data exchange. Um, I think there's gonna be a fundamental shift that's gonna occur with how data is captured, uh, utilized, and managed. And yeah. um, I think um, I, I know you've, you, you're a proponent of the data sovereignty. Like um, cities are going to have a lot of sovereign data mm -hmm. that um, may not ever go to the cloud. It might be on a local um, cloud um, to that to that community with uh, specific, you know, rights and privileges of how that data can be used to, yep. to benefit the city and the citizens. And this is this is a uh, and, and I want to make sure we get through these other topics too. But this is this is where um, I think the skeptics need to look at it is follow the money first off. Is it going to be invested in? Follow the 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 demand, and then from there see what else is going to materialize. Remember, before we had the app store, there wasn't a big adoption of these different uh, applications. It was the platform that enabled that to happen. So let's talk a little bit more about the business side. Um, I've been I've been diving into Edge for years, and this is in my opinion the first real implementation that is feasible. But the physical installs need software and a platform to tie it all together. And the concept here is a network of network. And what's awesome about this is that almost everyone in this meeting could be playing in this space. And let me share why. I'm just going to walk through a few pieces, taking your elements. So the first one, let's uh, let's talk about the pins. As you see, the masts here, those are going to be distributed out tens of thousands of those across the city, right? Yes. Okay. Then next to that, we're also going to have micro data centers because there's gonna be a little more capacity doing other things. So think of hundreds of those within a city. And then you look at Metro data centers, core data centers, a lot of our, our members today, they're also gonna participate because all of these are basically, imagine a Metro with pins and micro data centers and core, core data centers with capacity all accessible on a network. Well, then you're gonna build this network of networks. Like you said, transportation network, a health network. There might be something for autonomous vehicles. There might be a private network for, for other aspects. But this foundational infrastructure is what's gonna be able to serve that demand, correct? A hundred percent. I mean, if it, any, any adoption of edge, any adoption of pins is gonna mm -hmm. radically impact and grow the micro data centers and the, the core data centers. Um, Excellent. So, yeah, there's not, there's not, you know, the pin does not address all of their, you know, um, right layers. I, it basically accelerates the other layers to even bend. the applications we see in the future. I mean, if we are starting to see tens of thousands, hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of autonomous systems starting to build and maintain and just keep our resilient infrastructure, it's going right. to create massive amounts of data and a lot of new applications and millions of new jobs. Right, and I think the thing that people need to take away from this is, uh, this is not about people. People are like the, uh, think of it as the 8 billion people will interface this. This is about the machines. All the machines are gonna be communicating in a totally different way and there's orders of magnitude more of them. So when we get to 100 billion connected things, yep. majority of those are machines. 
and sensors and other pieces of it. So let's let's talk about how this is materializing. So today you announced uh, your first pilot with the Texas military department to enable autonomous vehicles, smart cities and connected things. Perfect timing. So tell us a little bit more about this project. Yeah, so um, going back to the, the comment you talked about the killer apps, um, you, the other one you mentioned is public safety. So mm -hmm. what uh, we saw with public safety, even coming from the, uh, a previous company, um, uh, we, we saw that industry as one that was bridging the divide of how this edge infrastructure could really meet and, and benefit the entire community, not just mm -hmm. targeted towards you know, one industry. So um, TMD, um, we've been collaborating with for, for almost three years. Um, it's Texas Military Department, but their entire focus is how can they protect and serve the community? How can they um, provide emergency services and disaster response? And when we looked at um, areas across uh, Texas to do initial deployment, it turned out to be a perfect location at Camp Mabry, primarily because they're you know almost 25,000 people strong across Texas. They're focused on how can they leverage new innovations um, mm -hmm. to better serve the community. And they also embrace things, realizing that if they could have even small robotics go out mm -hmm. after a, a flood, after a hurricane, um, the amount of data and insight that could give them yep. and the, the speed that they could respond to the citizens was super high. You know, um, this, uh, so Christian Bilotti has been throwing some other comments in here and, you know, just think about the outages that just happened in Texas and yes. resiliency is such a big, important part. So is security because these things are going to be distributed all over the city. So there's a lot of stuff we need to address within those, but um, building resilient infrastructure. And as you just mentioned, if there's a, something that is able to go back and find out what's going on quickly during these disasters, this is the distributed nature. And uh, I, I think it's, it's, um, it, it is really important. So this is your first deployment, right? Um, Camp yes, 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 Camp Mabry. Okay, so just talk a little bit about this and why this is the first. Believe it or not, we we're originally looking at another location that is um, very well suited as well, but um, the amount of support and the, the, the technical staff and the leadership at uh, Texas Military Department became um, a true partner and mm -hmm. a lot aligned with the vision that we were trying to do and saw it as an opportunity for them to innovate key solutions for them. The, uh, the entire deployment will be between 21 and 34 pins, mm -hmm. not, not because it has to be that density for specifically the campus, but it's gonna be um, representing a dense urban environment in a lot of these you know, uh, scenarios that we're um, working right. on. It will support um, pretty much all the advanced sensors that uh, we're expecting mm -hmm. um, need to be at the edge for capturing and processing that data. Um, we have now come to the conclusion that each pin, based on just the the data uh, for connected and autonomous, it could actually be a petabyte of data per month per pin. So nice. it's it's a massive amount of data, but it really wow. matches what an autonomous car would would experience over a a twenty four hour three days um, yeah. time period as well. And there's a lot of debate in that, but the one thing that is real is even if the number of data or the data that's generated in the car goes down, the number of cars is going to go up. You will compound this data no matter what as it goes in. So, uh, Jeff, I, I really appreciate you spending time with, here, time with me here and sharing this. There's so much more to talk through, but this is a good glimpse for people to get an idea. But if you have one thing you want in closing for the audience to take away from this discussion, what would it be? Um, collaboration. That I mean, this is this is this is a big big lift, and um, there's a tremendous amount of participation, a tremendous amount of benefits to a lot of players. I think the key is the ecosystem has to come together and um, be collaborative. Um, I think you've set out an incredible vision, and the uh, infrastructure masons has done I think a fabulous job, not just talking about infrastructure, but empowering people and and jobs. And um, a lot of people think, you know, autonomy is going to re replace jobs. Um, if you look at our full plan, w we see tens of millions more jobs than what's you know, taken away um, from the, the system. And we see a, a far more bold vision of what the U.S. can experience. Right. But um, awesome. key, key is ecosystem, collaboration. Awesome. Yes, everything. We're, the tide will lift all boats here. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, for your time and your insights in this.
um, I just want to remind everybody that you know the edge is real and it's happening now. This isn't something in the future. It's slated to be the literally the biggest infrastructure expansion in our history. And so there's a lot to understand, but there's also a ton of opportunity for everyone involved here. So take a look at the Autonomy Institute. It's autonomy.institute website. Uh, or you can reach out to Jeff or myself uh, and uh, we can continue to share more. So exciting times. Mm -hmm.